This lecture addresses the relationship between risk and sampling. Remember that audit risk is the chance we issue an audit opinion that says the financial statements are fine or fairly stated when in fact they are materially misstated. This is the ultimate answer at the end of the audit is wrong. And it's affected by how audit sampling is done. We want to ensure that we're inefficient in our use of sampling. That is, we don't want to do extra work. We would do extra work if we, for example, examine samples that were unnecessarily too large. We want to make sure that sampling is effective. That is, we do the right work. So we examine the most helpful controls. We make sure that we look at the right subsidiary balances. We do the most effective work in sampling. And we want to make sure that we correctly interpret our sampling results. So what can go wrong in sampling? Unfortunately, almost anything can go wrong. Even if the audit program is followed very precisely, and the auditors are very experienced, there can still be audit failures just due to the sampling. The biggest problem with sampling is that there's no way for us to be certain whether the sampling was done properly. You might have used the wrong check number sequence when choosing the sample. You might have thought a signature was an authorized signature when it wasn't. You might have confirmed an account that you thought was on the list in the sample and it was not on the list in the sample. Unless someone redoes all of the work that the person looking at the sample does, there's no way to know if the sampling was done correctly. The two types of problems in sampling are called sampling risk and non-sampling risk. Sampling risk arises from problems with items in the sample. In the textbook, you read about this problem as having a non-representative sample. Essentially, the problem comes from including improper items. Having items in the sample that are, are not really from the population is part of sampling risk. If you're testing signatures on payroll checks, but mistakenly include a general account check in your sample, you have sampling error, sampling risk error. If you misspecify the population, so you think the range of checks this year is from 51,001 to 61,005, and you take checks from that numeric range to test, when the end of the range should be 61,500, you've cut off part of the sample from being, part of the population from being in the sample. Both of these problems having things that are not really from the population or not really knowing what the population is are things that could be detected upon review in an audit but are very difficult to, to detect. Non-sampling risk arises from errors made in analyzing the sample. These errors are made by auditors too, but it's a different kind of error. In these errors, you have the right items in the sample and the sample is representative, but you do other things wrong. You declare a correct item to be incorrect. You declare an incorrect item to be correct. Think about looking at a signature on a check. Or think about comparing an invoice to a shipping document. If in your mind you reverse two digits in, an, in a document number, you might think that there was a mistake when there wasn't or vice versa. You can have a problem with projecting from the sample to the population improperly. We're going to learn how to do projecting from the sample to the population in both attribute sampling and in substantive sampling. We are going to learn how to do this by hand using tables and we're going to learn how to do this in IDEA. And we're going to see that in both cases mistakes can be made. You'll see those mistakes when you're doing the problems. We can also make a mistake interpreting the projection to the population correctly. We might think that we have an overall indication that the population is misstated when we really don't. 
or we might think that the population is declared to be fine when it we really should be concluding that the population is misstated. So what do sampling risk and non-sampling risk lead to? They lead to the wrong answer, answer from sampling testing. In attribute sampling, remember this is controls testing, a conclusion that a control operates as designed when in fact the control does not operate des as designed is a big problem. If we think it operates as designed, we will decide to rely on the control. So if we think there are good controls over accounts receivable, we might adjust the factors when we're doing testing for accounts receivable confirmations so that we confirm fewer accounts. If we are improperly relying on accounts receivable controls, that would mean that when we go on to do substantive testing of accounts receivable, we don't do a big enough test. A conclusion that a control has failed to operate as designed when in fact the control's operation is fine is the other kind of failure. And this kind of um, problem in an audit leads us to do over auditing. We might decide to look for a compensating control and go ahead and test that so we can rely on it. We might go to the client and say, look, your controls are bad. We need more money from the audit because we're going to have to expand testing due to the quality of your internal, contro internal controls. These are problems. What do sampling risk and non-sampling risk lead to? Well, they lead to the wrong answer from sample testing. In attribute sampling, first, a conclusion that a control operates as designed when in fact the control does not operate as designed leads to over-relying on the controls. We think it's fine so we go ahead and do less substantive testing of the related balances. If we find that cash controls are good, we'll do less cash transaction testing, for example. Or if we decide accounts receivable controls are good, we'll do less accounts receivable confirmations, fewer accounts receivable confirmations. If we really understood the correct nature of the controls and the problems that they had, we might do more testing so we will do not do enough testing in the audit overall if we have that kind of problem. If we have the other kind of problem where we have a conclusion that a control has failed to operate as designed when in fact the control is fine itself, we said it's bad, it's not really bad, we might have gone to the client and complained about the quality of the controls. We might tell the client we need a higher audit fee because the controls are poor we might decide to do additional testing that's unnecessary when we go on to do testing of transactions and balances. So these are wasting audit resources unnecessarily. In substantive testing, having sampling risk and non-sampling risk so that we get the wrong answer could mean that, a c that there's a conclusion drawn that an account balance is fairly stated when it's really materially misstated. If we did substantive testing that showed everything was fine, but we incorrectly um, analyzed the sample, we might declare accounts receivable as fairly stated. That can be a big problem for the end of the audit. We can also have a problem if there, we have a conclusion that a balance is materially misstated when it's fairly stated. This first problem in substantive testing leads us to give the wrong answer at the end of the audit that's the most worrisome to an auditor. But the second problem, that, you, that there's a misstatement when there really isn't, causes very hard feelings with our audit clients. So we really don't want to have either of those errors occur. So how can we reduce sampling and non-sampling risks? Remember, sampling risk, the risk that we have the wrong things in the sample, and non-sampling risk, the risk that we make errors in analyzing the sample. Well, we can carefully follow the audit program. We can double check that the um, factors and parameters we enter into IDEA to get the sample size and to analyze the sample match the audit program very carefully. We can use statistical sampling whenever possible to reduce the chance of drawing an improper conclusion. So remember when we talked about 
the differences between statistical and non-statistical sampling. One of the things we talked about is that in non-statistical sampling, auditors just decide what the outcome is. So we look at a hundred checks, and if you find two, I might say, okay, two is fine. In statistical sampling, the computer would tell us, well, if you found two out of a hundred, here's what we project the error rate is in the population. And that's more than you said you could tolerate, so you should reject this control, or you should accept it because it meets the, the parameters you set out at the start. It's more reliable to use statistical sampling. You can get less sampling and non-sampling risk if you construct more than one test of a balance so that many outcomes could lead to the same conclusion. We ordinarily don't test only one control. We ordinarily don't test only one way. Think about accounts receivable testing. We confirm accounts with client customers and we test the aging schedule and we test the allowance for bad debts and we test that the subsidiary balances add up to the balance sheet and so forth. All of those tests combined help us be sure that accounts payable or accounts receivable rather is fairly stated. And finally by adhering to proper audit and supervision we can make sure that the people who are doing the review of the sample tests are looking for indications that the person understood and followed the audit program. They might compare the history in the IDEA output to the audit program requirements. They might compare what's in the Excel databases for responses to accounts receivable confirmations with the data that was entered into IDEA to make sure the right data and, and all the data was entered and so forth. So those are just some of the things that auditors are supposed to do according to the auditing standards to reduce the chances of these risks. This concludes this lecture.